Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in uh, just a minute or two here. We'll let everybody come in. Um, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you want. If you are already on top of it and you know kind of questions that you'd like to ask, then um, feel free to put them into the chat or you can also use the question and answer feature at the bottom or top of the screen, depending on, on what your browser is. Oh, someone told me the chat function is disabled. Okay, well, Sorry about that, folks. We'll have to use the Q and A today. Um, so, for questions, you can you can go through that way. I'll see if I can. Maybe Adam, you can look um, to see if you can enable that if you get a chance. So, for those of you that uh, might be used to Zoom for meetings, this is a Zoom webinar which means that we'll have the guest panelists uh, visible to attendees and you'll be able to hear the panelists. The attendees like yourself that have registered for the webinar will be able to interact through the Q&A feature and hopefully you can get the chat feature working. Um, when we get to the Q&A section, then you can raise your hand and we can enable your mic. But for a webinar, um, it'll only be the panelists that'll be visible and, and audible without uh, permission. So just clarifying that for, for people. Okay, I'm, we're gonna get started just to uh, make sure that we are respectful of people's time. Uh, my name is Margaret Prophet. I'm the Simcoe County uh, Greenbelt Coalition's Executive Director. I'm also joined by Adam who uh, works for us SCGC and he's kind of our my right hand man if you will and and technical expert and communications and all that sort of stuff so the two of us are here today with our wonderful panel which we'll introduce in just a second um first while we're, everybody's coming in i just wanted to start with a land acknowledgement that today we're gathering in the traditional territory of the anishinaabek people and we'd like to honor the first nation communities in the area that uh whose ancestors were the first stewards of these lands, including to current day, the Chippewa Tri-Council, which includes Rama First Nations, Beausoleil First Nation, and Georgina Island uh, First Nation. These are lands that were meant to be shared with nature and in a way that honors the life that we've been given. The history of this land clearly de de demonstrates that we have not lived up to this intention or promise. To have hope for future generations, to have a sustainable world for them, we must recognize the value in each other, reconcile for past tragedies, and ensure compassionate care and concern for all. Further, we must recognize that the various components of our ecosystem, the air, land, water, flora, and fauna, are all interdependent and need to work in harmony. The only way forward that we see is together. So, um, about a little bit about Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition. For some of you, this might be your first uh, time being a candidate. Some of you may be new to our organization and kind of what we do. Before we get started, I just wanted to introduce ourselves. So we were established in 2017 in an effort to better protect our natural landscapes and promote healthy, sustainable communities. We have grown from 15 member groups to now over 40 grassroots community organizations across Simcoe County, all the way up from Midland Penetang, all the way down to uh, Beaton, New Tecumseh area. Our focus is to help educate public and elected officials on how to build communities that are climate friendly, that avoid costly sprawl and are financially sustainable while maintaining the green spaces we need to avert a climate disaster. As we, as we know with the Canadian Medical Association, uh, only 20% of our health outcomes are attributed to healthcare resources. The remaining 80% are considered social determinants of health and include things such as the environment, housing, income, and social connections. So our goal at SCGC is to help connect, educate, and mobilize communities to ensure that we have healthy and equitable places to live uh, going forward. So in concert with that goal, we have launched our Community Leaders for Sustainable Simcoe uh, Education Network Program. That is where our pledge is being offered. That is where these... Um, uh, webinars are are included. The, the program's goal is aimed at supporting local counselors, counselors and community leaders as they make brave decisions to take climate action, build better communities and address the social determinants of health. Uh, as I mentioned, we've launched a pledge that you can sign to publicly demonstrate your commitment to these principles. And Adam will put a link um, 
hopefully we can get a link in the chat there shortly um, and he can link to that pledge. Finally, uh, we'll get started just to let you know, we're gonna have an informal panel discussion about food security and supporting local agriculture. Um, our panel of local experts will also be taking your questions at the end of the, of the discussion. So please make sure that you entered into the Q&A feature or raise your hand and you can ask it yourself. Uh, today's guests, I'll just change the view so everybody can see everyone. Um, we have Courtney O'Neill, who is the community uh, coordinator at the Simcoe County Food Council. We have Mike Ryan, who also works with the Simcoe County Food Council and also a former president of Gray County Federation of Agriculture. Then we have Brian Shelley, who is the executive director of the United Way Simcoe Muskoka, and Jacob Kiri Moreland, who is a farmer uh, with Bass Lake Farms and also a member of the National Farmers Union. So thank you, panel, for being here. Um, I think one of the things to kind of get our feet wet, if you will, into this discussion is talking about food security. And there's kind of some intertwined perspectives about what food, food security is. There's a, the idea of food sovereignty. There's an idea of community food security and household food security. So um, I'm wondering, Brian, maybe to start us off, if you could give us kind of your perspective on kind of that the food security lens, um, kind of how those things are different. And then we can ask other panelists to weigh in if you afterwards. Yeah, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and thanks for having uh, me here on behalf of the United Way Simcoe Muskoka. And thanks also to all those who have joined us. Um, it's important that you're here uh, because it speaks to the fact that you care. Um, and that's uh, that's so important for all of our elected officials. Um, the difference, so, it's, chall it's, it's challenging because we use this term of food security as kind of a catch-all. And really there's two, um, there's two different issues. There's access to food um, and that's the community food security issue. But when we talk about household foods, food security, it's actually an economic issue. Um, and I think it's, or that's, that's the perspective that we have at United Way would be that um, access to food at a household level has less to do about the access to food in the community as much as it's, it's about the ability to, to afford food. Um, and I think sometimes we get this confused um, and we think that about food security as being, you know, farmers markets and, and food banks and, and all these pieces that they come together. But really it's about the individual's ability and capacity to purchase food. Um, that'd be the perspective that we would be, that we would hold at United Way. Thank you. Um, Courtney or Jacob or Mike, anybody want to add on to this for that? that idea about food security and what it kind of looks like in our community or what goals we should have for it? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there and build on uh, what Brian was saying. And first, I want to echo thank you to everyone joining. Um, I share the same sentiment that I'm grateful that people are here and having these conversations. Um, and so community food security and household food insecurity sound very similar, but they are very different. So I like to think, uh, I don't like to think, the definition of community food security is ensuring that everyone at all times has access to safe, nutritious and culturally appropriate food in dignified ways um, through sustainable food systems uh, with a focus of social justice um, and community self-reliance. So there's a, those are some really big terms, but we kind of look at that as community food access, like Brian said, and doing a deep dive of how we grow food, the level of involvement people have in food provision um, and kind of getting that assessment of your community. And then household food insecurity um, is when an individual or a household does not have enough money to afford food, um, so lacks that financial resources. And, you know, they sound similar, but they're quite different. And so we actually do a disservice when we don't clarify um, those definitions because um, we can't be as intentional with the programs we deliver because we don't understand um, we're not doing as good of a job of reaching our goals. So um, both very complex and there's definitely a gray area, um, but different um, in nature. Right, thanks. And I'm wondering too, when you're talking about, you know, dignified access to food and community access with Jacob, I mean, that kind of starts to get into the idea of food sovereignty. And so do you mind speaking about how that kind of, how food sovereignty kind of looks at it and, and, and what those goals would be? Sure, I can jump in there. 
thanks, Margaret, and thanks to all the other panelists and everyone for coming. This is great. So, yeah, I, I would agree with a lot of what's been said already that, you know, there's this issue of food and food security, food insecurity is a very complex topic. Um, and at the end of the day, I think for me, the fundamental fundamental issue, as much as it is economic and unequal uh, distribution of economic resources, I think fundamentally we go one step deeper and I think it's it's a political inequality. I think there's an unequal distribution of power in our society. And, and that plays out in many ways. Um, one of the big ways is that some people have a lot more power uh, and wealth and can, you know, control resources in society, including food. And so for me, food sovereignty is really a, a looking at the issue of food through a lens of power in society. And it's about empowering people to um, have the right to food um, and to define their own food and agricultural systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that as a municipality, then if you're thinking about, you know, because you do echo what Brian and Courtney have said about making sure people have access to food and making it easy for them. I think then a municipality that's looking at whether it be community food security, household food security, or food sovereignty, it really is about planning with people or sharing power with people, right? Removing barriers for people to be able to access or control their own food. Is, am I getting that right? Yeah, and the food system. So that's, we're talking about, um, there's a lot of people who may want to grow their own food, but they don't have access to land. Um, they may not have access to tools and equipment and resources or markets um, or the knowledge. Right. And so there's there's a lot of issues, I think, that inhibit long term food security and also like sustainability as well, as Courtney talked about, that it's not just having access to food like today or tomorrow. It's about, you know, having a, a system that's sustainable that we can sustain over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And so that that I think requires people to be involved in the food system and all aspects of the food system so that we have a localized food system. So we're not dependent on global markets, for example, um, for food imports, as we've already experienced through the pandemic. And recently, as you know, there's various global shocks to the system that food prices can rise quite rapidly, um, as well as, you know, the availability of food can be diminished quite rapidly if we don't have that if we're not in control of our own food system. Absolutely. Mike, do you have anything to add to this or do you want me to proceed? No, I think it's just an important point to make the distinction between household food insecurity and community food security. Um, and the discussion around community food security or food sovereignty um, that you can um, be trying to achieve one and, and not harming the other or vice versa. They're not mutually exclusive um, they're not mutually exclusive in, in the ways that we can cure both or, or see community food security reach the point, whatever your, your view on that is. But at the end of the day, household food insecurity is a poverty problem. And, and whether it be economic means of living wage employers and that municipalities can attract and raise people that they can um, afford um, to purchase food, um, that household food insecurity itself um, is a big issue in Simcoe County across Canada, um, and at the end of the day is a, is a poverty reduction uh, problem, that, or pro poverty reduction solution that will raise um, people out of household food insecurity. That, and that leaves a great segue. I've actually have two threads I wanna pick up on. One is the, that kind of global food system, but I wanna pick up on your immediate thread, which is talking about um, food security. And I know that there's many people within Simcoe County that are privileged enough to not recognize that community food security, as well as household food insecurity is an issue here, right? They, they assume like they go to the farmer's market, they can go wherever they want to go. They've got a, a Zares down the road from them that they can drive to, but not really understanding that it's a problem here. So I was wondering maybe Courtney or Brian, whoever wants to take it, you know, can you explain just how big of a problem it is in Simcoe County for those that maybe aren't aware of it? Sure. I mean, it's, it's estimated that the numbers in, in, in Simcoe County mirror those across um, Canada. It's, it's estimated that one in eight 
um, individuals are, are experiencing food insecurity and that, and in fact, what uh, as a parent, what I find even more jarring and upsetting is that when we look at children and youth, that number is actually one in six. Um, so that's one in six young people in our community that don't know where their next meal is coming from. It's very prevalent. Hmm. That means in a, in a classroom of 24 kids, um, four of those kids are experiencing food insecurity. If right. my math is correct. Yeah, I think so. I think it's what it's today, Tuesday. <laughs> I have my, my Tuesday work for you now. I think your math is correct there. I mean, it, and I guess there's there would be certain populations that would, I'm assuming, would be more uh, prone to food insecurity. Is that is that correct? Courtney? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for example, we know 63% of individuals um, relying on social assistance programs. Um, so Ontario Works on Ontario Disability are household food insecure. So do not have enough money for food. Um, so this is, this is an issue. Um, what I can also share is that uh, with the Simcoe County Food Council, we have the privilege of sitting with all the food banks around the county once a month. And our meeting was last week with um, that really amazing group. And so what we can share with you is that um, the food banks are reporting a 50% increase over last year in the number of people using food banks. And they are seeing more families than what they're used to. They're seeing more post-secondary students. Um, they're seeing many new newcomers and refugees uh, coming from uh, Ukraine, South America, requiring multiple levels of services. Um, and I think what's really important to note here with the caveat is that we know only one in five people who need the food bank are using the food bank. So this is only giving us you know, one slice of the pie. We're only getting a really small picture of what's actually happening, um, but the numbers are pretty telling. Hmm. So the, the last kind of study about food security was kind of like probably pre-COVID to get at the numbers. So it could be, the picture could be way worse now, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think when you, than, when you combine, yeah, when you combine the impacts of the pandemic as well as rising inflation, and, and we know, you know, we all feel inflation, but a lot of us have the privilege that um, the choices that we make are, well, maybe we will, we'll put off that family vacation this year, or maybe we will, um, you know, stretch that family car out for one or two more years. When you're living literally week to week, um, you don't have the luxury. And, and so instead of foregoing the family vacation or, or foregoing the new car, it's foregoing a meal. It's foregoing food. Um, and, uh, you know, if we think about the big household expenses that a family deals with um, between rent um and paying your utilities and feeding your family not paying two of those gets you evicted so the choice becomes pretty quickly as to which you choose to not um provide your for your family with and that means that and that's why we see children going hungry yeah absolutely and i i would you know there's a lot of talk when it comes to um food issues about food banks, right? That, you know, donations, corporations like to get involved in it, you know, politicians like to get involved in it. It's it's a very feel good activity. But I think to your point earlier, Jacob, it doesn't really address food insecurity, but also the food sovereignty part where people can access the food that they want when they want it in a way that's culturally and economically and dietarily preferred by them. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, talking about Courtney mentioned post secondary students um, experiencing food insecurity. And just this weekend, I was at, I go to Lakehead University. So I, I'm there often and I'm speaking with a lot of post secondary students. And as an institution, there's a study by Meal Exchange, and Lakehead University was reportedly had the second highest rates of student food insecurity in any post secondary. Now, a lot of those numbers are skewed to Thunder Bay, but I know also it's a large issue in Aurelia. And there's, there's a residence there, a residence building, and they have to spend money on a meal plan. And then during the summer, the cafeteria is only open till two o'clock. So they miss most of their meals. And then they have to go to Costco for hot dogs because that's the only food place near. And they don't have kitchens in their residence buildings and they don't have access to the kitchen on campus. All that to say they have money, but they don't have access to the facilities and the um, elsewhere, uh, the other things to to prepare their own food, um, like they don't have access to a kitchen there. And one of the solutions would actually be to change the policy um, pertaining to food services policies on the campus. Um, and then also we're there and we have a farm club and the whole campus is a farm. 
and the food that's grown there is for export markets. So I watch students walking through these cornfields, breaking their teeth off because they want to a bite into fresh produce in the corn, not realizing that this is corn destined for cows or for export. Hmm. And again, there's this huge farm, students wanna grow and participate, but they lack the power to access the land and participate in the food system in more meaningful ways. Right, well, let's pick up on that thread a little bit uh, with kind of the power and municipalities would have influence and power in kind of food sovereignty, food security, you know, supporting local agriculture, that whole local food system. And Mike, I'm going to ask all the panelists, but I want to kind of uh, shift a little bit into some of the ideas that our candidates can maybe think about that could be implemented. So do you mind outlining one or two things or, or the things that you think are pretty important um, that, that a, a role that a municipality can play in either the food system or supporting local agriculture or uh, food security. I know it's a big question. So, but I got four of like really smart people here. So I figure each of you take off two or three, and you'll probably cover them all. <laughs> like at the end of the at the end of the day, the majority of agriculture in Simcoe County is destined for export market or outside Simcoe County, and so um, agriculture itself and supporting in Simcoe County is a lot similar to economic development. Um, they need infrastructure to get produce to market. Um, the planning department has a big power over what sort of diversified on-farm uses, um, so to support local agriculture. Um, do you have policies in place that make it easy and accessible for a farmer to put a produce stand at the end of their lane? Um, and then the other issue becomes taxation. Um, and if MPAC comes in and a farmer has built that on-farm store, do they get, they get zoned commercial or industrial and get taxed as if they're using the services of an industrial park in town, um, which can shoot tax rates through the roof. And so for some of the local on-farm um, initiatives in Simcoe County, that has been a big issue. They, they build uh, infrastructure um, and MPAC comes in and zones it and wants to um, triple or quadruple the tax rate and as if they have the services of an industrial park, which they don't. Um, and the other thing is any decision around the table, making sure you have um, an agricultural voice at the table or that, that input. Um, there's many things that we don't think about, um, traffic common measures through main arteries in towns that aren't wide enough for farm equipment to get around or how roundabouts are designed when you're doing planning. There's a lot of little issues that if you have never run into the challenge, you don't think about. Um, and whether it's supporting big agriculture or little agriculture, all these little things add up to supporting an ecosystem that, that supports agriculture in your community. Thank you for that insight, Mike. And that, that was, um, I, I was aware that, you know, most of the, the commercially grown food in Simcoe County is kind of going for exports, but I never really appreciated about the economic development angle because you, you hear municipalities talk a lot about economic development and it almost always turns into like tourism or attracting development and never really thinks about how the economic development can be geared towards people who already live here, who, you know, improving the lives of, of the people that are here directly. So Courtney, I'm going to turn to you next, if you don't mind. And what are some things that, um, that you feel municipalities, what role can they play in this in this big topic that we've decided to take on today? Yeah, um, you know, the first thing I'll give a shameless plug that next week we are launching our municipal election toolkit, which we have outlined concise recommended actions under six key areas, which I think um, would provide even more information than what we are sharing today. So I would definitely encourage candidates to um, head over to our website, get on our newsletter to really dive deep into that. Um, but there are six key areas. And so um, we think about advocating for income solutions at the provincial and federal level when we are talking about that poverty piece, um, creating affordable housing, investing in safe, affordable and reliable transportation, being a living wage employer and supporting living wage employers in your community, um, strengthening food, municipal food policy and creating a food and agricultural strategy. Uh, which really taps into what Mike was just speaking about, looking at those policies, um, economic development office, and then really looking at how we foster food literacy in our communities. Awesome. Can you just, uh, just for the people I know what you're talking about, but maybe other people don't with the living wage, can you just explain a little bit 
about the what the the living wage is for Simcoe County and how that's calculated. And then I'll turn to uh, Brian to add on to his thoughts and finish with Jacob. Sure. Yeah. So different than a minimum wage in that um, a living wage takes into account the area in where you are living, the cost of housing, resources, transportation, a number of different pieces. Um, and then a calculation is done to figure out what that living wage is for your community. Um, and it, it's quite a bit higher than what a minimum wage, which is set by the province is. So um, I'm blanking at the moment. I believe it's $19 for Simcoe County, um, 19 something. Brian can uh, clarify that, but quite different than what the minimum wage is. And so when we think about that, every hour that gap exists in what people are being paid and that means less money available for food um, for either themselves or their families and so when we become a living wage employer we allow people to afford to live in our community to reinvest in our community um, to thrive and then we know that that has greater health um, impacts for them yeah, and, and shame to, to add on to your shameless plug, I'll add my own shameless plug that some kind of Greenbook Coalition is happy to be a living wage employer. Uh, and we've been one for, I think, 2019 or 2020, just, just before COVID kind of uh, hit. So that's great. So Brian, uh, to add on to Courtney, what are some things that, what are the roles okay. that you see municipalities playing in this discussion? So I was going to speak to the living wage as well um, and transportation. So building on what Courtney was saying, and yes, the living wage uh, for Simcoe County is $19.05. Um, and so that's important to recognize as well, because when we look at, at similar sized communities across the province, um, you know, the living wage in Chatham, Kent, I think is $16. Um, even just over in Gray, Bruce, it's $18, right? So it is expensive to live here. Um, it's not surprising to any of us probably that's expensive to live here. But again, just to return to my, not to hit a hammer over the head, rent is not negotiable. Your utilities are not negotiable. So if someone is not making a living wage, the one of the only places they have they can make up that um, is feeding their family. Um, but to speak to the, the transportation piece, I think, again, if we look at, at the pieces that, uh, that municipal governments can own, I think it really is thinking about how public transportation can be accessible, affordable, and connecting people um, to food. Um, and so, I mean, it's one thing to be able to afford your groceries, but if you don't have a way to, to get there um, and to purchase the groceries, then, uh, then we're putting other barriers in place. So I think that's, that's an, uh, you know, as we look at how uh, public transportation has, is evolving, I mean, you know, there's great examples um, where we have municipalities that have looked at Uber as a, as a public transportation um, innovative solution. I'm not suggesting that's the right answer, um, but it's but certainly an innovative way of looking at it. So looking at how we can make public transportation um, more accessible um, for everyone so that uh, so that everyone can access the food if they can afford it. Yeah, absolutely. And to, to build on your living wage, when we um, did our community connection guide, which has policies with which all of you helped actually um, from a food security and, and local agriculture perspective, um, there were only a couple of areas in southern Ontario, central southern Ontario that were higher for living wage, and those are all GTA communities. Um, so, you know, I think we were third or fourth as far as the, the highest living wage and, and that gap, as you said, just continues to, to grow. And I, I, the reason why, you know, we took on these big topics, I mean, you need land, water and food, right? The, the housing, housing, water and food are really important. So we've got, you know, this is our food one, next is housing and the next week is water. What you just said, Brian, about the interconnection between transportation and how that leads to accessibility to food and, and like these things, I think municipalities and, and governments in general have been so used to problem solving in silos that, you know, if we want to fix transit, it's a transit issue, but there's a way to fix transit that also helps other issues. And if you want to fix food security, that's a food food issue, which is an, <laughs> there's some intermix there that we wanted to um, to bring out with that. So thank you for that. Jacob, you're going to round out this question about um, what are what are the role that you think municipalities have in either food sovereignty or, or local agriculture? Yeah, well, I would echo for sure that every municipality needs to have a comprehensive food and agriculture strategy, an actual plan of action, including like goals, clearly established goals. Like we want to set a goal of having zero hunger in our community, for example, or set a goal of having, you know, 20% of food consumed locally produced locally. 
And I think that any strategy um, has to have very clear goals established uh, that are progressive and that you know increase over time. And then there would also be reporting uh, mechanisms as well to make sure that whatever strategy that they agree to, um, then we can actually have uh, measurable follow-ups so that there's some accountability. I've seen um, over the last 13 years, municipalities in Simcoe County talking about food policy, um, going back to a Food Matters conference at Lakehead. We've had a food and agriculture charter through the county. We've gone through successive forums and discussions and there's policy pieces. Um, but I think what really needs to happen is that municipalities need to understand that food, as the others have said, that food impacts all these other issues and all these other issues impact food. And it is definitely, certainly within the realm of the jurisdiction of the municipality to address these issues. Oftentimes I hear that municipalities and especially you know, city staff, people say that food is not their responsibility, it's not their jurisdiction. Um, and so they don't bother to participate in this process or advocate or prioritize food and agriculture policies. So that, that's a big one is we need to get people together, um, anyone who's willing to sit down and, and create a comprehensive plan and strategy for accomplishing goals surrounding this issue. And then we need the funding to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And for me also as a farmer, um, one of the big issues that's affecting local agriculture, I would say, especially as a new and young farmer, is just access to land. So we're experiencing a, a radical rural gentrification in our area. So I last time I checked, farmland in Ormadante was averaging $3 million per average farmland. Um, and that makes it extremely difficult for any young person, someone who's not inheriting land or large sums of money to participate in that system. So municipalities need to be setting land aside. Um, protecting land and then making it accessible for young people on a long-term basis in order to learn how to farm. And I think that would really help to create a new generation of farmers who I think will be um, some of the largest and best champions of local food security and local food systems. And if we can create living wage jobs for young people on those farms, all the better. Thanks for that. Mike, I'm just wondering if you could build on, on Jacob's point there about, I know that the farming, um, population is is aging um you know there's a lot of concern about the uh, who's going to take over farms and that sort of thing and i i appreciate what what jacob said about how municipalities can kind of um play a role in in securing that so i was wondering if you had any further ideas to build on to to what jacob had just said i think like the preservation of farmland through active planning and um growing up rather than out um is important for agriculture as a whole. The OFA is running a campaign right now on, on preserving farmland. Um, the city of Hamilton um, prevented the expansion of its settlement area into existing agriculture um, areas. So that was a big win. Um, there, there's roles to play in the planning department, but there's also bigger issues outside of, we see um, periods of history when, when I was starting farming in the 90s, um, in Gray County, not far from Collingwood, we saw this gentrification when farmland, when a farm was worth a quarter million dollars and a house in town was worth a quarter million dollars. Um, and with COVID and people moving out of the city, we see that, that drive of um, people wishing to leave the city, driving the price of farmland in certain areas where the price is. Um, but we also see movement of agriculture from out of Oxford County, where the most expensive farmland in southwestern Ontario that's conventionally farmed, um, whether it be into the north, north of New Liskert, or this emigration is bigger than just one single municipality. And um, there's issues that municipalities are, um, ways that municipalities can help control it. And there's also um, larger issues at play beyond um, the local municipality. And I think it's making an effort to do all you can at the local level. Um, so that when provincial or federal policies change, that, that you're in place to make sure that um, agricultural land is being preserved. And I think too, that underscores, you know, there are things obviously locally uh, municipalities can do to preserve farmland and help set up local food systems and address community food security. But sometimes I feel municipalities forget that they can have a real job in advocating and lobbying at 
higher levels of government, not necessarily more important, but you know, at the provincial level, uh, at the federal level. So there is a role for them as well there too, I would, I would argue. Um, and kind of wrapping up what, what you and Jacob had said, when I used to work in corporate a long time ago in another lifetime, my um, boss used to, used to say to me, you care about what you measure. And if you're not measuring it, you don't care about it. So I would think that people that are on this webinar today, they came, they came here because they're concerned about food security, supporting local agriculture. And I wonder if they get to council, if they ask their their municipality, what are you measuring that shows that we're supporting agriculture? Kind of like what Jacob had said earlier about setting goals and like, we want to have this, this sort of thing. Are you measuring things? Are you taking data that helps you determine whether you're getting closer to that goal or not? Sometimes we, we um, espouse, we care about something and then don't have really the data to back it up. Um, so the just on that kind of note, there's kind of a quirky thing in the ag census. Um, Chatham Kent actually gained farmland, um, was one of the only municipalities to gain farmland. And um, so when we use statistics, it's important to see how they're calculated. And farmland is calculated in the ag census, census of where the farmer lives. So if he rents farm land outside of his municipality, um, it shows up in the ag census as being in Chatham Kent because his main homestead is in Chatham Kent. Um, and so having an inventory uh, inside the municipality, make sure you're using statistics that um, are actually representing your municipality and not um, farmers can farm in many different jurisdictions and might be re misrepresented inside that data. Hmm. Very interesting. There, For those, um, I'm sure some of you may already be aware, but maybe some of the the guests aren't that there is a push to start using the Canadian index of well-being uh, at the municipal level or provincial or federal level, which talks about, you know, how well are people doing and on a, on a variety of fronts beyond GDP, beyond housing starts, uh, beyond transaction at the real estate level. Um, and I think that would that's a good example of like you're saying of collecting data and making sure the data is valid that supports kind of the actions and, and the goals that you might have. Um, so interesting, I don't know if everybody saw this article today, I'm sure maybe Jacob and Mike, maybe, or maybe all of the panelists have already heard about this, but I was told by um, the VP of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture that, that um, the other day I was on a meeting with him, and he was talking about Driscoll's, which is the berry, you know, if you buy strawberries or the, you know, Driscoll's, and how they had bought up a huge swath of farmland uh, in southwestern Ontario around London. And then today I saw an article uh, in the CBC talking about how Driscoll's and other large California um, commercial agriculture, you know, businesses are starting to pair with greenhouse growers in Quebec and, and Ontario to, to see because when they're looking at kind of the droughts and and um, climate change projections, many of the places that we rely on to import fresh food from, such as California, you know, may not be viable sources of food in the future, which goes right back to how accessible is our food. And I think, Jacob, you talked about this at the beginning about access to food and those systems can be easily taken away. We saw with, with COVID, you know, at the very beginning, you may remember the vaccines that were produced in the U.S. were going to stay in the U.S. and the vaccines that were produced in China were going to stay in China. And, you know, Canada was kind of scrambling because we're like, well, where, where do we get our, our vaccines from? That sort of thing. So kind of with that reality in mind, um, I was wondering if you could, I, I don't know who did, whoever wants to take this question, if maybe everybody does, how can forward thinking councils in the region be, be ready or prepared for this kind of new reality, you know, that, the, that climate change is going to be coming, food access probably uh, dwindling or threatened. What, what kind of things do you think councils can start doing to kind of prepare um, for that particular concern? Well, and I think to build up on your example of the pandemic, if we learned anything over the last two and a half years, um, it's that crisis, crises um, drive innovative thinking and, and actually pretty quick solutions. And so I think we have to start looking at food security as a crisis. Um, it, the horse is out of the barn. And, and so to that end, 
we have to start thinking about, you know, so your example of um, how, you know, there was that Canada had no access to vaccines and then all of a sudden Canada had more vaccines per person than any other country in the world, right? I mean, that didn't happen accidentally. That's because we went as a country um, and our policymakers went into full crisis mode. We need to start shifting our thinking around food security to crisis mode because it's a crisis. Mm, that's a great point. Courtney? Yeah, one thing I think about, um, not so much in the food production and provision, but um, household food waste. So we know in Ontario, um, house, household food waste is, uh, it is attributed to 6% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so municipalities can take a lead role in um, increasing awareness around the issue, um, around household food waste, and then going a step for, further and putting in programs to help reduce household food waste. Um, and so I strongly encourage becoming a part of the Ontario Food Collaborative, um, which really you know, provides those resources for municipalities to look at food waste from a climate change lens um, and providing those resources to help you do that. And you know, encompassed in that is that food literacy piece. And then it go, there is a lot of understanding a greater understanding about where our food comes from. Um, so it's a very holistic approach, but something in the purview of a municipality. Absolutely. Uh, and Jacob, you know, you were talking about municipalities putting aside, uh, setting aside land. And as we know, a lot of farmland is in competition with farmers from developers, but it could also be kind of more of these farming conglomerates. How do you see that whole piece happening for, you know, young farmers or, or access to farmland? Well, one, one opportunity would be to the establishment of municipal farmland trusts. So just as our municipalities through the Simcoe County, um, Simcoe County has forests. We have a, I mean, we're very proud of our network of public forests here in the county. Um, and they use revenue generated through those forest activities, sustainable forestry to reinvest back into increasing the public forests. I think we could just as easily do the same thing for farms in our region. I think there would be people willing to donate their farms in Simcoe County as well for this purpose uh, and having leadership from our municipalities to permanently remove farmland from the speculative real estate market and then connecting with our post-secondary institutions and our high schools and our elementary schools to developing um, food literacy and agricultural education programs for young people especially so that there's clear pathways for them to then develop opportunities of regenerating a local food system. So that's, that's what I would recommend and we're currently working on that at Lakehead University right now. We have a urban uh, Perry Urban Campus with over 50 acres of farmland, and there's a, a movement of students and faculty and community members to permanently protect a percentage of that farmland to create a community farm for research and education and recreation for the whole community. So I think um, that I would agree with Brian that this is a crisis. It's been a crisis for a long time, and the factors, the underlying conditions that are driving this crisis are only getting worse. And I think we need bold action um, to address this issue. And, you know, as we go to the farmer's market in downtown Aurelia, and often we're the only local farmer there for years um, because there aren't young people who want to get into this. And you know, if they did, they don't know how or where to do it. So that I think is, is, is a tangible step, municipal land trusts. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just like, uh, how some municipalities started to recognize, although truth be told, the recognition of a crisis is a lot different than acting to the crisis. You know, we saw a lot of climate crisis declarations passed and then status quo kind of budgeting and status quo kind of uh, responses as far as policy goes. But at least there's a, a start of awareness, I guess. Mike, do you have anything to add on to this, this conversation about, uh, you know, preparing for these, these future future problems and food security as a crisis? Yeah, nothing too big to add. Like farmers are the ultimate adapters. Um, business is, it's a hard job. It's a low profit margin job. And they're, if you're in the agricultural business and successful at it, you've adapted to a lot of adversity and challenges in your life. Um, climate change, you look across Simcoe County or Gray County, 
30 or 40 years ago, corn or soybeans weren't grown in those communities because one, there, there wasn't the heat units and there weren't the varieties to grow in those areas. And so we'll continue to see a migration of crops northern as, as climate change happens. Um, you go to Earlton or Northern Ontario, you'll see a lot of farmers coming out of Southwestern Ontario and, and those growing seasons are aging. Um, community food security and the choices that society wants to make about their food um, is one thing, but I have confidence that agriculture will continue to adapt and, and be successful moving forward, um, no matter where um, these issues go. Absolutely. And, and thank you for that refocusing. There was a, a panel I was on years ago with the Federation, um, Ontario Ministry of, of Food and Ag, and it was this whole thing about how to better, you know, work with agriculture or people that are concerned about food. And I was going through all the questions and I'm like, aren't you guys really just talking about how to address food security? Like, isn't that what we're really talking about? And they're like, oh, I guess, I guess that's kind of what we're talking about. But when you shift the frame of mind to addressing food security at all the different, you know, access points and all the different levers that you can pull, it changes the question and it changes the answers that, that you receive, right? Because now you're actually thinking, well, how do we do this as a community? How do we do this for, for individuals? So just to, we're going to get into questions from the audience soon. So there's a couple there. If you haven't had a chance to ask your question um, or put your question in, please do it into the chat or to the Q&A feature. I've got one or two more questions and then we'll kind of open it up uh, to the audience. So let's refocus. Um, I always like to end kind of at least the, the structured questions on a one or two takeaway thing. And so we've got kind of two topics that are intertwined and interdependent, but very different. One is, you know, shifting that narrative or, or talking about a narrative of, of food security and community food security as far as, you know, um, levers that you can you can address with the social determinants of health and economic conditions. And then you have food systems, which also kind of interplays with all of that. But let's focus at food security at the household level. And a council that says, yes, I want to in, you know, increase food security at the household level. What is one thing that you think would be an ideal place to start? Uh, we'll start with you, Courtney, and then I'll go Brian, Mike, Jacob. Yeah, short and sweet two part answer. One, read our municipal election toolkit. We've worked with a number of community partners to outline key recommended actions um, under the six pillars that I had mentioned before that provide a nice menu of options. And two, reach out to the Food Council. This is not something you have to do alone. Um, and I would say at the very least, we want to be a part of the conversation. Um, and so we think that would this is like a good step forward for um, any candidates here today in municipalities. All right, Brian. Yeah, so I think, you know, you, you made a good point, Mark, that there's a difference between declaring a, a crisis and acting on it. Um, and so I, I challenge uh, local municipalities to set legislative targets um, as it relates to food insecurity and food poverty and your community. Um, PEI is the first and only jurisdiction uh, to have legislative targets in place. Um, it's part of their 2121 Poverty Elimination Act. Um, but put it down on paper and uh, and be bold because if it isn't, um, then we just keep talking in circles around a crisis but without action. Excellent. Mike? I think like recognizing that at the end of the day, it's a poverty issue household food in, at the household level of food insecurity. Um, so affordable or attainable housing, um, attracting living wage employers. Like if you can get housing costs under control where people can live affordably, there's jobs where they can make enough money to purchase food and transportation to get to and from that's affordable. Um, I think those are the main stays of how we fix household food insecurity. Wrapping up with you, Jacob. That's a that's a tough one. I would echo Courtney, read the read the toolkit see what other people are working on in the county. There's people who are spending like so much time on this issue and then just implement the recommendations you already have. There's likely <laughs> all the recommendations out there already. Um, and then one thing is just, you know, 
Um, having more spaces in our communities where people live in their neighborhoods and elsewhere where people are actually gathering around food, where people are growing it, sharing it, producing it. I think having those food community food spaces really help to, to you know, further the discussion so that we can have those discussions on a regular basis so we can begin building community around these issues. And then I think that'll help to bring about larger systemic changes. Okay, awesome. We've got a couple questions here, but the last one is, when you're thinking about food security or thinking about local agricultural systems, however you want to think about it, what's a myth that you would like to dispel for our um, for our listeners today? Something that you think has perpetuated this idea of us not identifying as a crisis or something that you feel is really kind of uh, blocking the action that we need? And we'll start with you, Mike. I think more agriculture in general is that like recognizing that 98% of farms in Canada are family farms. Um, we have this idea of corporate agriculture, but at the end of the day, behind those is um, they've incorporated for succession planning reasons, for business reasons, but at the end of the day, farming as a whole is still a family business. Um, one in eight jobs in Canada are directly related to agriculture, whether it's upstream or downstream. Um, and there's information, the region of Waterloo in their study said that for every on-farm job, um, there's four jobs in the community that are, that are supported by that one on-farm job. And just recognizing the importance that agriculture plays in your community um, for its livelihood. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I underscore your point earlier is to start thinking of agriculture as economic development and to, to widen um, how we think about it. Brian and then Jacob and then Courtney. Yeah, Margaret, we talked about this earlier, but just to emphasize that, that food banks don't solve food insecurity. They're necessary because of the state of crisis that we're in. And I don't, you know, I think sometimes when we have these conversations, it's almost like food banks are demonized. They're not demonized. They're there because they need to be there right now because people are in crisis. Um, but we need to understand that we need to start looking at solutions beyond food banks. The first food bank was not created. It was created as an emergency response. Um, it was never meant to be a, a long-term sustainable solution. It does not affect systemic change. And in fact, if anything, it just it just sustains this imbalance of power um, to speak to what I believe it was Jacob was talking about that before um, around, around the power dynamic. Um, it, it perpetuates this, this power dichotomy um, between haves and have-nots. Um, so while it's necessary and it's, it's, you know, I donate to the food bank and my family members volunteer at the food bank, it isn't the long-term solution. It's a necessary evil right now. That's that's a really good, important point. Jacob? Uh, I would say one of the myths that I encounter, especially from politicians, as we may have a lot of politicians here, is that they think that investing in our local food system is actually a liability. So we're often told that they, there's no money to invest in these programs or these opportunities. And I would say it's actually the opposite. We, can't, we actually can't afford not to invest in uh, local food systems and food security because the costs of food insecurity are too great. And I would challenge them to actually do a, a cost benefit analysis and see what the costs of having children going to school hungry are, uh, what the long term costs to our society are. And I think that the cost of the solutions and the alternatives that have been proposed are a lot more affordable and will be a and provide huge returns moving forward. Great. Courtney, you get to finish it off. <laughs> okay. I'm going to drive home the point around household food insecurity um, and not having enough money for food. And there's, um, I think when we get clear about who is experiencing this, so one in eight in our community, and knowing that as of um, the end of 2021, 52% of individuals who do not have enough money for food rely on wages and salaries. And so when we start to understand that um, it's not just a, a budgeting problem, but these are people in our community that are working um, and still don't have enough money to put food on the table. We can really start to understand the gravity of the problem. And like many people have echoed here today, um, that it is a crisis and we need to, we can start reducing the stigma associated with this when we better understand the problem and who's experiencing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think each of you in your own way throughout the webinar have talked about the stereotypes or the assumptions we make about things, whether it be there's no money to, to invest in agriculture because it's not a high return on investment or that 
all farmers or commercial farmers or that all people that struggle with food insecurity are just irresponsible, lazy people that don't have jobs or, you know, the community, you know, food banks are great. They should be the, the thing that everybody jumps on, not saying that they don't help. I, I don't want to be the one that says, forget the food banks. They do help, but they're not, they're not the solution, right? There's a lot of um, myths and stereotypes types and, and assumptions we make. And I think it just clouds the um, getting to the solution. So uh, we have a few questions. And the one question is, we have some candidates that are thinking about starting up local gardens um, in the community. Would that help? What are some barriers? What are some things that the panelists have thoughts on about, you know, trickiness to it or what they've learned about it or how to frame those kind of discussions. Um, Jacob, you were the one that was talking first about, you know, access to, to plots and that sort of thing. So maybe you should, you should start this one off. Sure. Yeah. I've, I've been a big proponent of community gardens for quite a while and I've visited probably hundreds of community gardens and there's lots of great things that go on in community gardens, but typically, you know, it, Food production is not the main focus of community gardens. It's very difficult to like pr produce a lot of food in these gardens. They're often very small. Um, there's often lots of people coming through and, and that's not typically the main focus. If our focus would be on food security and really increasing local food production, then I would say the municipality should be investing in community farms and hiring full-time farmers who are knowledgeable in their field that can then engage the community in. Um, in more productive um, uh, programs to really, you know, produce a lot of food for the local community. So for example, at Lakehead, the city of Aurelia has allotment gardens and there's 15 of them and they're four by 12 feet in these boxes. And then surrounding that there's 50 acres of corn and soy monocultures. And so as a as a small scale farmer myself, I know what it would take to have like two, three acres of productive mixed vegetables. And we could easily be doing this in our peri-urban zones to engage people in that. Mm -hmm. So I think shifting from, you know, we definitely need more community gardens and allotments where people live, but also I think we need to start thinking about what community farms might look like. It might being the uh, other active farmer on the on the panel, do you, do you want to add anything to that? No, but I think Jacob makes an important point about community gardens um, are important. There's lots of valuable things that come out of them, but but their biggest impact is on social isolation, uh, isolation um, and bringing people together and building a sense of community. Um, they shouldn't be thought of as a solution for for food security. Um, and yeah, great, Courtney or Brian, either of you want to weigh in on this? Um, yeah, I would echo the points that have been made and um, we're attached in our toolkit is a report that is um, all around community gardens um, as a community well being um, and a community engagement strategy so we've um, done a deep dive into the literature um, about the impacts community gardens can have and why they're not a poverty reduction strategy so um, that we believe is helpful for municipalities as well as community organizations so if that's something that is of interest to you um, feel free to read that it will be in the toolkit and then reach out to us with any other questions absolutely brian did you want to get in on this or yeah, i'll just be blunt um community gardens are lovely living wage is a solution excellent and again it goes back to you know actions you have to be clear, and, and Jacob kind of talked about this at the beginning, you have to be clear about the actions you're taking and why you're taking them. If you're conflating, we're supporting food banks because that is a way to solve food insecurity, or we're doing community gardens as a way to solve food insecurity, then you have to be clear about it does have a purpose, but it's not necessarily aligned with the, with the solution that, that you're going for, right? And this is why the benefit of today's panel, I hope will help a lot of the municipal candidates um, to to help really distill what the issues are and how to navigate into action. Um, the next question um, is talking a little bit about, you know, as a way to address food insecurity, as a way to build community, what do panelists think about an updated version of bartering, um, you know, where people would come together to exchange food, to help grow, like, 
that kind of system? Is there anybody that wants to kind of um, comment on establishing some sort of community barter or community share programs? Is this kind of what we were talking about, Jacob, with what your vision of with the municipal farm? Well, they're like from my, in my example at our farm, like we, our farm is pretty close to the city of Aurelia. So we get a lot of people driving by. Um, I do a lot of education in the community and we're at the farmer's market and we talk to a lot of people and a lot of people want to come out and help on the farm, for example. They may want to come for a few hours a week and they want to participate. So we've been over the years designing different programs to involve different people in the community. So in one sense, we have a number of people over the years who come out and they've bartered you know, a few hours of their time to help us with harvesting or help us with planting or different activities. And then they go home with a large sum of produce. And in many of these cases, people think that they're getting out more than they're putting in. And, and we feel the same way about them. And we build these really strong connections in the community. Um, and I think that these kinds of opportunities, you know, it doesn't provide us with a living wage right away, but it starts, you know, building a community of awareness, building um, community power, um, where we feel, you know, empowered to start, you know, proposing more significant actions and working together. So we're not so isolated. Um, so I think having gardens and farms in the community where people can access, I think there's a lot of, you know, bartering opportunities there, which again, just helps strengthen the community, which I think will help address these issues over the long term. Hmm. And I think, Brian, that's kind of what United Way's model is, right? Is all kind of working together as far as you know you get donations and you help all the other groups and it's it's really supposed to be less competitive and more supportive so do you see opportunities um for bartering in a different kind of way or are there systems that you're aware of where it's it's kind of helped you know everybody everybody rose the same way yeah, I mean, certainly from a, from a fundraising perspective, that's the unit anyways model, right? Is we raise funds um, and then we work with community partners to address um, large scale issues. I'm not sure if it really speaks to, to bartering. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not- Maybe not I'm so not, much bartering, but I was meaning more of that- this, this idea that when we work together on, on complex issues and everyone comes to the table with, you know, even if you look at who's at this conversation today, right? We all come from different backgrounds um, and different experiences. Um, but again, it's it's about working together on a complex issue um, to understand that that we all own a piece of the pie to solving it. And so, to Courtney's point earlier, food security isn't just about access to food. Food security is about um, a living wage. It's about it's about um, transportation. It's about um, the spaces that we use to, to grow food. It's it's it is a complex issue that everybody owns a piece of. Absolutely, uh, Courtney. Did you want to add anything to this? Or yeah, something that comes to mind that we talk a lot about is dignified food access. So, um, and being clear on who the target audience is. So, um, oftentimes when we try, when we want to increase our access to local food, um, which is amazing, it may not always have the price point that is accessible to all. Um, so even in, in terms of like bartering, I even think more of like equity markets. Um, so kind of like the pay what you can, um, I feel like would be an interesting model. We see that at like things like the seed in Guelph where they have that um, bulk purchasing like good food boxes around Simcoe County or other, other, other options as well. Um, so not specific bartering, but I feel like if we think of dignified food access at the core of how we offer food programming, um, those are two other options to think about. Absolutely. Um, I know we kind of touched on this, but uh, it is a question. So it maybe didn't get answered as clearly. Um, the question is, you know, and I know Courtney and Mike, it's about the, the community uh, guide that you have coming out um, about the food security. But the question is, what legislations are suggested for municipality to combat household food insecurity? And um, I know that there's there's topics in your in your guide that's coming out, but just wondering maybe to still it down. I, I think that maybe what we're trying to get at here today is that it's not just a you put this policy in place and then everything is fixed. It's it's very intertwined. But what are some key places, uh, I know you've mentioned some of these already, but just to read it, what are some key places that a municipality can look to, uh, what departments or what sort of policies 
could they put in place to really get at the household food security? Oh, Courtney, and then I'll do Jacob. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so first thing come, few things come to mind. First, understanding the definitions that we are speaking about today and understanding the prevalence of household food insecurity in Simcoe County. One of the first resources that comes to mind is connect with the local health unit. They are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to um, this information. And also this fall, they're coming out with their nutritious food basket survey, which they haven't been able to do because of COVID, which really tells you what the cost of food is, um, which, you know, no surprise, we're going to see that being a lot more relative to income. So connecting with the local health unit, um, working with them collaboratively is really important. Um, another thing at a local level is something that um, we have been working on as well is looking at um, community volunteer in income tax clinics and making sure we have these free volunteer tax clinics in every municipality in our county and making sure we're partnering with organizations that support support populations that are least likely to be completing them, making sure we offer transportation, access to internet. Um, so I, I do believe that is a really tangible step um, while also partnering with the health unit and doing advocacy at different levels of government. Thanks. Jacob, did you want to add anything to this? Um, if if this was a crisis and there were people in our community who literally can't afford food to eat and they're getting sick and dying prematurely, then I think we, we should think about creating food and agriculture departments at the municipal level. Uh, I think it's going to take, you know, many staff working full time on these issues from the municipality to get these things right, to execute these programs that are being proposed. So I think we should be thinking, you know, ambitiously about the issue and what municipalities can do. And I think having, you know, um, whole departments focused on these issues, I think is really what would be necessary to really implement these strategies that we're proposing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because currently, currently food security, like I, I sit on the Aurelius, City of Aurelia Food Advisory Committee, and there's no staff person at the City of Aurelia who would be in charge of this food strategy. Community gardens currently sit under parks recreation that's seen as a recreational activity. So we need to, to rethink the, the municipal structure. Okay, perfect. And I think this next, we've got this one last question and I just, again, it goes back to assuring everybody has a, a similar understanding and that we kind of address myths. And I think Mike, this might be the best question to start with you, but then I think Brian could probably round out a little bit. Having a living wage higher than uh, a regular wage, isn't that going to make food prices more expensive? Everything's going to be more expensive. Does it does it actually accomplish anything? Um, or does it undercut its own objective, I guess, is, is the question. The rising tide raises all boats is kind of the saying that comes to mind. Um, at the end of the day, labor in certain agricultural industries is, is a high percentage of cost, but in a lot of others, automation and, and the movement towards automation, um, most agricultural producers that are working right now are, are living wage employers or higher. Um, um, labor intensive jobs are not um, a big attraction in this economy currently with the amount of um, the low unemployment in the area. So I think. Um, Sometimes it's a myth and there are certain uh, agriculture will adapt um, to produce food to that, to that market. Um, I'm not too concerned about rate, like living wage affecting food prices, but. Okay, Brian, maybe you can talk about the kind of living wage and how people yeah. assume it's gonna make everything worse. Sure, and so again, we are, United Way, Simcoe Muskoka is also a living wage employer. I forgot to get that plug in there. Um, and I think that ties into two pieces. Um, number one, um, we currently have no vacancies in, in our office. Um, I would say in the charitable sector, we would be um, rare. Um, our, our staff retention rates are high, um, our staff. Um, and so that obviously is, is better to our productivity and, and the out, outcome, output for our organization. Um, but also, you know, to, to the question specifically, there was a study uh, in California um, 
a fairly recent study um, that found that a 25% increase in wages um, only increased the cost of end product by 1.45%. Um, so the benefit um, of increasing wages does not get all, all eaten up because at the end of the day, um, wages are only a percentage of, of the cost of product. Mm -hmm. And I think too, we have to come back to the humanness of it all. If you think about someone working an eight hour day and there's a $4, which is for making math simple, a $4 wage gap, that means every day they're $32 short at the end of the month. What is that? 900 bucks, is that right? 30 times 30 roughly? You know, they're, they're short that amount of money and it's not just adults, it's kids too, it's seniors. It's, there's, it's not just able-bodied people um, that are going to be impacted by this. And as we've talked about before, it's people that are generally already working jobs. So um, how much should we all pay to ensure that our neighbors are fed and um, taken care of, right? That that comes more to an ethical thing, I would say, than, uh, than an economic thing. And I think sometimes we revert to economics before we revert to, to ethics. Um, we're going to end at 115 and I think uh, I don't see any really any of the questions coming in so I'm going to do the closing um, first off thank you to all of the panelists today it was a very condensed uh, webinar on a large topic topics I should say and I appreciate each of you for bringing your perspectives and hopefully uh, helping the, the attendees today better understand these these intertwined issues as a reminder, we have two more lunch and learn sessions. You eat, <laughs> you eat while you learn while you learn from us. We're not providing lunch. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this Thursday we'll be talking about housing and how that's important and kind of addressing equitable communities, climate resilient communities. Adam will put the registration link in the chat. And then next Tuesday, same time, we'll be discussing uh, protecting local waters. Um, again, the registration chat will be in the link. And, and once you leave the webinar, it's a five five uh, question survey, please just take a, a second to fill it out. And uh, that way we can better understand how to help you and how to improve. Um, if you would like to contact any of the panelists, um, Adam can put the, the links within the chat. I really suggest when you get onto Municipal Council, start to look for community organizations and individuals who are working in these issues. They want to help. They want to ensure that um, they're achieving the objectives because it's their community too, right? So please don't feel you get into municipal council and you have no one to help you. There are a lot of subject matter experts within the community. As Courtney mentioned, you've got the health unit, United Way, some kind of food council, you've got local farmers, um, us, all of these, these groups can, can, can help you in different ways. So please uh, make use of the community experts that you have. And if anybody wants to connect with me directly, you can reach me at margaret at simcocountygreenbelt.ca and our website is simcocountygreenbelt.ca. Again, panelists, thank you so much. And to our attendees, thank you. Um, a recording of this webinar will be sent out within the next week to all registrants. So um, we'll be able to share that with you later. And uh, if you wanna save the chat because of some of the links, you can click on the chat feature um, there are three ellipses. There's an ellipses there at the bottom right hand corner. You can click on that and hit save chat. So therefore you have all of your, your links or any sort of registrations or, or key notes that may be that may or missed. Uh, thank you again, everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful day. I wish you all the best in your campaigns. And um, thank you, panelists. Thank you. Bye.